John Hollinger of The Athletic releases his top 25 NBA free agents for this offseason. Where does Miles Bridges fall on that list? Plus, we have Richard Stamen of Locked On NBA Big Board. He grades our mock draft that we just took part in, and then we grade our mock draft history in the third segment. That's all today on the Locked On Hornets podcast. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for joining us and making us your first listen every day. We're free. We're available wherever you get your pods. That includes YouTube. I'm Walker Mail. In case you don't know, I've covered Charlotte sports for a while now. Doug is the founder of the podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Walker Mail, at Doug Branson, LOH, and the show handle on Twitter at Locked On Hornets. You can also find us on Facebook. If you like our Facebook page 1,000 times, then Doug is going to dress as as grandmama we are slowly climbing i saw one comment say if he does not get to see doug dressed as grandmama then life will not mean anything anymore i don't know if he said wow. that i could have maybe <laughs> i could have maybe a... tweaked that anymore or something i could have tweaked that possibly but well, people want to see mean, you as grandmama doug people want to see it pretty badly i get it well then do the work i'm challenging i mean we get like we get like two thousand views on these videos on youtube that means Mm -hmm. that there are people out there right now that are that you're watching this right now and you haven't liked us on facebook what are you doing we got to be close to 500 though that's coming up real soon and when we get to 500 you promised the people that we would bring back the matt geiger fact of the day yeah look i mean i'm trying to help you guys out i'm trying to help everyone Mm -hmm. out here but we'll bring it back just go like us on facebook also, if you go to Facebook, you can find just the latest aggregation or just blatant lie from NBA updates that said, now it's a report that I said the Charlotte Hornets are working on a deal for DeAndre Ayton that wow. would center around Miles Bridges, PJ Washington, and the 13th pick. That's a thing that has since been tweeted at me again. It's it's happening. Like, you just, that, well, that it came from an same. account called NBA Updates. So. <laughs> it's <laughs> like what's funny and you is just now, said it. you just said it again i yeah. mean you're at you you know you you are asking for it right now you're just saying I, it no i'm asking to stop because it's happened now we're i mean it's like three weeks out from when we talked about it approaching it and now, even the hypothetical trade that i somewhat proposed hypothetically wasn't even right the details anyways it's crazy um let's talk about miles bridges that guy that was supposedly in that report that I mentioned on Locked On Hornets just a couple of weeks ago. So John Hollinger releases every year the top 25 NBA free agents according to his board's projections. Basically, that is a uh, that's an abbreviation for a bunch of different catch-all stats mixed into one or a couple of different ones, right? There's Darko, there's LeBron, a part of Basketball Index. He Take mixes that, that together down. with a little bit of a PER thing, whatever, right? So just in case you wanted a basis, that's why he has this player here, this player there, in the top 25. Miles Bridges comes in at number six, and he's the second player listed behind the tier, not quite max guys. Miles Aha. Bridges is, yep. So not quite max guys. Who are the, ma- who are the max guys? Do you have the list? The max in front of guys me? in order are Kyrie Irving is number one. I agree. James Harden is number two. Bradley I know a lot Beal- of people won't agree with that. But I, I agree. I know a lot of people, you know, they, they got a lot of feel. Everybody's in their feelings about James Harden, but I agree. Max guy. Bradley Beal is number three. And Zach Levine, number four. So those are your top four guys. And then it enters the second tier. Not quite Max guys. DeAndre Ayton is number five, funny enough. And uh, it's Miles Bridges, number six. And so here's what he has to say about Miles Bridges. Bridges is a fascinating study this offseason because Boards says he's worth pretty close to the max, but it seems unlikely his price will get quite that high. I do think that's interesting. Even potential offer sheet spoilers like San Antonio or Detroit seem to have their eyes more focused on other targets. They could return to Bridges later in the process, but having their money on ice while Charlotte waits to match is pretty significant. It's a significant deterrent, especially in a market where free agency has played out with a remarkable speed, some would even say unfathomable, right? Playing on tampering, whatnot. It uh, it happens. Obviously, the rule says it shouldn't. His last uh, paragraph here says, where that leads is likely a four or five year deal to return to Charlotte in the $25 million a year range, give or take a few drachma. Nice little word there. If so, 
The Hornets will have some interesting decisions to make further down the roster as they try to skirt the luxury tax. Couple of things. One, if this plays out, as John Hollinger suggests, I am much more comfortable with a $25 million a year contract, as I imagine a lot of Hornets fans are. One, it's going to be beneficial to the team the lower this gets. And Miles Bridges, I, I'm in team. Hopefully players get as much as they possibly can. Good for them if they get the max if they get you know 30 million dollars a year not my money right as yeah you've said that before but 25 million dollars a year certainly is a lot more comfortable i think because we still don't know what's on the horizon for miles even if it is somebody you want to bet on and i've said a million times i do want to bet on him and it does make it hard for the hornets to try to skirt the luxury tax as he mentioned but this is nothing new and of course 30 mil a year would make it that much harder what are your thoughts when john hollinger writes this I think it's really interesting, and the interesting part to me is Miles Bridges and his thought process about how he values staying in Charlotte, playing around with an organization that believed in him from the jump, and with players that he enjoys playing with, like LaMelo Ball. How much value does he put on that versus how much has his confidence grown in his own abilities and own ability to earn and get as much money as possible and, and would, you know, if if another team came along and, and the Hornets were unwilling to match, uh, you know, I think that's where it gets interesting. Portland, that's the one team that I didn't hear in John Hollinger's assessment. And that's the team that I've been reading could have eyes for Bridges and could run up that price tag. Uh, but we know that, you know, Miles has wanted to stay in Charlotte. And is and wanted to honestly, I think he wanted to take that original extension offer that they made him, and the, his agents came in and said, "Hey, wait a minute, buddy, because <laughs> hold on, now, hold on a second, there, cowboy, you could make a lot more money if you just hang on." Uh, so twenty five million a year, uh, that'd be great, I think, uh, for both parties. So I've got this, I've got the salaries for the Charlotte Hornets pulled up here. So they were over the cap last season by about six million dollars at 118. I believe the cap was 112. The cap is due to rise to 122. They currently have 108 million on the books pre Miles Bridges deal. Now some of that player options, which they're due to pick up. I mean they're going to pick up PJ. They're going to pick up Lamelo. What's interesting is the Jalen McDaniel's Nick Richards. That's about three million dollars, but it's not enough to really matter in this particular scenario. But right. one twenty-five puts them at one thirty-three, so that's over the cap. Luxury tax is one forty-nine. So then <clears> you're <throat> talking about what do they do with the mid-level exception? How how close does that get them to the luxury tax? And then more interesting than that is in twenty twenty-three, twenty-four, when they're talking about an extension for PJ Washington. You know how close does that get them to the tax envelope? That's that's the most interesting question about all of this is what happens with PJ and what kind of center do they bring in who you would hope starts? Or are you just going to rely on 13 or 15 or are you going to bring in a veteran free agent? Try to figure out the money to where that works, along with extending Miles Bridges for a long time at 25 to 30 million a year. At that point, every single million matters and mm -hmm. uh when especially when you're talking about the future with pj and so that that is something that the hornets are going to have to try to skirt hopefully they they jalen mcdaniels has to be picked up too i i just yeah. view that like one one and a half mil essentially close to two um you know that would make some sense i think nick richards might be a casualty a payroll casualty here for so, sure yeah so that that's something with borrego deciding not to play him the other coach would have to really like Nick Richards and keep him on this roster. Um, DeAndre Ayton being number five. So I, I reading that, Doug, you know, th these boards projections, it it has some like it, it has some things built in to avoid some of the deficiencies with PER, even though there is a PER element to the board's projections. But that means that it favors centers a little, right? Ballinger and, made the PER too, so it's, it's uh, interesting right, exactly. that his own projection. He, he, yeah, he, he talked about, I promise it's not about ego. PER works here, but, you know, okay, fair enough. He said, uh, as a result, the, uh, excuse me, here's what he writes about DeAndre. Phoenix surprisingly didn't extend Aiton before last season, and they seem reluctant to pay him the max after the Suns fizzled in the playoffs. You know, they talk about sign and trading him, and, you know, he um, had the base year compensation rule. They have to bring back $20 million because of that, even if they pay him the max. And so 
He says this at the end, as to question of how much he's worth, even in my valuation system that devalue centers pretty strongly, the numbers suggest Aiton is worth the bite of the apple. And be, I, I think that's interesting, <clears throat> right? Because here's somebody that's young who we've kind of had this philosophical question before, is a center something you can wait on in the draft or pay at max like 10 to 15 million a year and get away with it and allocate money elsewhere. DeAndre is one of the centers that is clearly worth much more, even with a projection that maybe devalues center in uh, some way. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to have several options, I think, to upgrade that position. And I don't, you're not going to do it in the draft for next season. I mean, I think that's really, I keep repeating that, but I think it's worth repeating that I don't believe that there's an option at center where they are currently at 13 and 15 that will definitively deal with your issue that you could not protect the rim next season. They've got to find that elsewhere. Do they find that in the trade markets? You know, if, and the timing of all of this is really interesting, right? Because right now, currently, uh, you know, they're under the cap. Uh, but once you once you do make that re-sign of Miles Bridges, then it makes um, acquiring free agents all that more di- all that much more difficult. And if you do what we did on draft day, the mock draft day, then you don't have to trade for DeAndre Ayton anymore. You bring back Miles Bridges, and you have a starting center in Jakob Pertl. Somebody helped us grade that. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Richard Stamen of Locked On NBA Big Board, he joined us to criticize us or praise us in what we did with our mock uh, draft day uh, decisions that we made, trading for Jakob Pertl in the 20th pick instead of just taking a player right there at 15. We also selected Mark Williams at 13. We just stayed home and decided to make that selection. So Richard Stamen had some thoughts on all of that and um, maybe a little bit deeper analysis on some of those players as well. Let's talk about that in just a second and talk with Richard Stamen, but not before we discuss Sakara. Feeling your best starts with what you eat. Sakara helps you live a healthy, balanced lifestyle and truly enjoy it with delicious, plant-rich, transformational nutrition that builds a foundation for living in your best body. Now is the time to seek wellness, joy, and abundance in all areas of your life, starting with what you eat. With Sakara, you get nutrient-dense meals, snacks, and supplements that nourish your body without ever having to sacrifice taste or quality. You don't have to do that. Looking and feeling your best shouldn't mean deprivation. Instead, you can choose joy and abundance because Sakara's organic plant-rich transformational nutrition programs are designed to help you cultivate body intelligence so you can nourish your body and experience the results that you want. Right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to Sakara.com slash locked on 20, or you can enter code locked on 20 at checkout. That's Sakara, S A K A R A dot com slash locked on 20 to get 20% off of your first order. Sakara.com slash locked on 20. Richard Stamen, going to grade our draft coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Now we're going to welcome Richard Stamen of Locked On NBA Big Board. You can follow him on Twitter at Mavs Draft. He is very deep in the draft analysis right now amongst everybody on that show as well. You can catch, of course, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. We're happy to talk with him for a few different segments. We're going to sprinkle in these interviews throughout the rest of the week. But the first one is going to be here where he gets to criticize our moves in the ultimate mock draft that just took place over the past week and so Richard we appreciate it are you excited to just take a flamethrower to whatever we did in this ultimate mock draft yeah last year I roasted you guys on the the total mock show with David Locke and I I felt bad because you guys chose Zaire Williams and I hated the pick but in hindsight wasn't that bad of a pick you damn okay. right you're damn well, you right didn't, you didn't roast bad. me Zaire Williams I didn't... Is... go ahead Doug well, I didn't have anything to do. I just want to make this clear. I didn't have anything to do with that pick. So whatever happens to Zaire, that's not that's not on me. That's on Nada. Uh, no, that's you- on me. That Zaire Williams, that was who I fell in love with. Doug likes to say, here's who I give the draft rose to. I gave my draft rose to Zaire Williams, who was selected one selection above us, surprisingly, with the Grizzlies, you know, the Hornets picking mm-hmm. just one selection afterwards and did pretty well this year. So just bake that into the cake with any of the criticism, right? Maybe you give us some leeway, Walker, because you were so good in selecting Zaire Williams. I act like this guy was an all-rookie you know, member. Anyways, um, all right, let's move on. Here's what we decided to do with the draft. Uh, Doug, why don't, why don't you set us up? Because you're the guy that decided to 
maybe wheel and deal behind the scenes a little bit. Tell us through that uh, that process, and then we'll get Richard's uh, criticism or praise. Yeah, just really quickly. I mean, we have we have two picks, thirteen and fifteen. So I think the Hornets have an opportunity to wheel and deal a little bit and and really shore up uh, the big rotation. Maybe get rid of a contract that they don't want anymore. And we had a lot of offers on the table, but all, we were trying, we were attempting to move up into that seven, eight, nine, ten range to get into the Jalen Duran uh, conversation. Unfortunately, we were unable to make a deal because we did not want to give up. P.J. Washington, or really Walker didn't want to give up P.J. Washington. I was okay with hitting the eject button. He wasn't. We made a deal that we both had to agree, so that that deal fell through. We had a deal with Portland. It fell through. Ultimately, we pick at 13. We go with Mark Williams. Now it's time to go 15, and I sensed a, a deal could be made. We had a couple on the table. We didn't like one from the Mavs. We didn't like another from the Knicks and involved Julius Randle. We ended up making a deal with the San Antonio Spurs to trade the 15th pick for the 20th pick and Jakob Pertl in exchange for the 15th pick and Kelly Oubre. So Richard, how'd we do? Yeah, <laughs> Come on now. Come on. Tell us the good stuff. You want the honest truth? Yeah. Uh, yes, y'all please. Did, y'all did great. I, I actually really like it. Uh, the best part of it, in my opinion, uh, was not getting rid of PJ Washington. I was very scared. That ah, I yes, to roast you. Richard, we are best friends. You and I'm about I. To hit, I'm about to hit the eject button on Richard Stamen. <laughs> Richard Go Man, more like it. <laughs> I'm a big no, PJ Washington stay. fan. Please stay. All right, go ahead. Get, I'm get, a big get, PJ Washington fan. I also have some personal bias. Like he's from my hometown. I played with him before, so like I'm all for okay. keeping him on Charlotte. I think he's a great fit to. Um, in, in theory, of course, but I liked I liked y'all's picks too. I, I think getting you know Jalen Duran, I don't think there's a big drop off right now between him and Mark Williams. So I'm a big fan of that. And then also Jalen Williams is one of I mean I think where you got him, he's a steal. What was it like twenty? And with that haul, and you got Jakob Pertle, that's a big win. Yeah, I want to talk a little more about, and we're going to do kind of like a big man segment as well. Maybe we dive a little deeper, but you said that you don't think there's a huge drop off between Jalen Duran and Mark Williams. W- what does that look like? Why is there a gap between those two? And do you still have Duran ranked ahead of him as far as the big guys go? Yeah, I still have Duran as the number one big man that's not named Chet Holmgren. Just because he's so young, he's so raw, he shouldn't even be in this draft. But you look at a lot of their strengths and weaknesses, and they're pretty similar, right? Like Jalen Duran is a guy who passes. Mark Williams also passes. I think that's an underrated trait for him. Can defend the rim, can block shots, can finish at the rim, rebound. Jalen Duran does all these things well. The big difference for him is that he's a lot better in terms of switching on to guards. So that, to me, like that one trait, yes, it is a very big trait for a big man but it's not the end of the world because some of the other skills Duran has could drop off whereas I don't see it for Mark Williams dropping off and tell us about Jalen Williams uh, that that we picked at 20 I didn't really have much to do with that pick I really seeded that pick to Walker because I like I was tired I'd been on the phones all day <laughs> trying true. to try to make a deal I, I look like Joe Dumars I had like three phones attached to my face so uh, he goes with Jalen Williams tell us I mean how do you grade that pick out at 20 I think at 20, it's an A+. Plus. I, I really – I've tried so hard, and I'm not just trying to, to suck up to it's walk It's so here. good, Richard. Thank you so much. <laughs> but, but, I'm, you know, I've tried so hard to find, like, some hard negatives on Jalen Williams' game, and for the life of me, I just can't. He's a guy who he exploded as a junior. He went from shooting under 40% as a sophomore at 11.5 points per game to 18 points a game on over 50% shooting – 40% from three, 80% from the line. Really good playmaker. The first few times I watched him, I thought he was left-handed. He's that ambidextrous. He's right-handed. So when you get someone like that, I think he's an immediate impact player with good upside too. I mean, as we just saw, he just had his first good year in college. So there's a lot of upside to be had. Well, Richard, for me, the, the weaknesses that I think may have showed up on tape in some aspects, you were a little worried about the agility on defense. Maybe you were worried about the athleticism, and that's why I thought when he went to the combine and jumped with a 39 max inch vert and was tied for the third best record at the combine, it's like, all right, now we can't find anything. The The agility numbers were like somewhere middle of the road from everybody that was measured, which, okay, still, I guess, I don't know if it proves a bad point. It just means that he wasn't exceptional 
Um, but still, 7-2 wingspan. You know, that was the biggest among any player that has any chance of playing two guard in the NBA that was measured at the combine. It was, you know, the longest, you know, standing reach of nine feet, uh, PNR ball handler, guys and analytics darling, as I said earlier. Like, I, I just, you're right. Like, I, for me, I think he would fit well in almost any system, right? Like, I think he is kind of that plug and play. You want him to handle the ball? Cool. Catch and shoot, contested, fine. Transition, great. Like, I just, you're right. Like, I, I don't know why he has been somewhat towards the 20s in a lot of the other mock drafts I've seen. Yeah, my guess is simply the first two years and then the competition. Even though the West Coast Conference had a really good argument of not being far off from like the ACC this year, but just the talent in the two conferences is a little bit different. And I think that's really it. You look at a guy, I mean, you said it best. He's length makes up for agility too. That was my big knock was you watch how a, a guy starts at half court on an ISO. He's probably beat but his length never takes him out of the play because of that, because that's 7-2 wingspan. Let's go back to that 13th pick. So we we make, I think, what is the consensus pick for the Charlotte Hornets at 13, Mark Williams. What I've seen in most mocks, but not every mock has the Hornets taking Mark Williams at 13. I've seen Tari Eason go there. I've seen Ochai Abaji go there. Uh, I've even seen Dyson Daniels slip all the way to 13 in some of these mock drafts. Uh, now, Dyson wasn't available. He had been selected a few picks above us, uh, but both Abaji and Eason were there. In fact, they almost both of those players were almost available to us in, with the 20th pick. But is there? can you make a case, Richard, uh, that, that we should have taken Eason or Abaji over Williams? Is there even any kind of case that we should have taken either of those players over Mark Williams? Well, I have Mark Williams the lowest on my board of those three. But you look at the the team fit and everything, you get a big man who does what no big man on Charlotte right now does, and that's protect the rim, rebound, and I, I just think score at the rim at a high level. So I think it addresses so many needs that the drop-off isn't major. My philosophy is like once you get to around 12, there's a big drop-off. And from there, you go from 12 to like 30-something. It could be any order. I could see most of those guys going in the first round. Obviously, there's only 30 picks in the first round, but for the most part, I don't think there's a big enough drop-off to justify choosing one or the other. I think it's just personal preference at that point. Okay, Richard Stamen is a very busy man come NBA draft time, especially because we use him all across the Locked On Podcast Network, and so we are going to try to just do a bulk Costco-style interview. We get three segments out of him, and then we leave him alone for a while, and then we probably bother him at another inconvenient time, but at least we give him a little bit of a break. So we are going to give you a couple more segments here. Big man segment coming up, as well as a name game. He said he was about the games. Me too. So we also bond over that. We'll continue to have Richard Stamen on for a couple more segments here on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Subscribe to the NBA Big Board podcast. Yeah, do that too. Do it. Tom Diddley D. Thanks to Richard Stamen once again. We'll go over what he had to say about our draft, and we're going to go over our own mock drafts in recent years and grade ourselves. That's coming up next. But let's talk about Bet Online first. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup between the Warriors and the Celtics, the NHL Hockey Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, and of course, all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sport wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Let's talk about what Richard Stamen had to say about our draft coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Richard Stamen making up for his criticism of me last year, even though I acted like Zaire Williams was like a top five rookie. But hey, at least he, he was good. He contributed on a playoff team, Doug. So I think that is going to be something good. I'm going to use that as a positive when we go back and revisit our mock draft history. But let's talk about what we did in this mock draft because Richard Stamen loved it. He liked what we did with Mark Williams at 13. He liked getting Jakob Pertl and the 20th pick in exchange for the 15th pick and Kelly Oubre. He liked that we did not give up P.J. Washington. So me and him are like this because of that, because we both love P.J. Washington. He's invited to the fan club. And Portland wanted P.J. when you wanted to move up to 10, try to get Jalen Duran, who he still has above Mark. But what were some of your interesting thoughts as to what he had to say um, about what we did at the draft? I think it's interesting how close that, and Richard pays attention to this, as close 
as any of the, as, of any of the you know major draft experts out there and and how close he has Duran and and Mark Williams you know right. how much of a coin toss that is I think I think that's a fair assessment of how he feels about those two players and so that made me feel a little bit better about failing to get to Duran and ending up, ending up with Mark Williams who I already felt pretty good about anyway um, and I didn't know a ton about Jalen Williams I learned a lot there so I feel good about your selection of Jalen Williams at twenty. Uh, and, I, and I'm looking across the YouTube, Twitter landscape for us, and I'm not seeing a ton of like bad, you know, criticism of what we did in this mock draft. So that's, I think, a good sign uh, that, and I think it's a sign that the needs for this team are so clear, and the answers lie in this draft, both in the players that are projected around this area, and in the options that they have to make trades. The big question is, will this organization actually be able to pull it off? I'm not as confident in that. I'm not as confident that they will see that Mark Williams is such a beautiful fit. I'm not as confident that you know this organization will do what is necessary with these draft picks to bring in a, a center rotation that is actually legitimate and enough to get you into the playoffs. Until I see evidence of that, I've gone two seasons now thinking that it was going to happen. So I'm just going to wait on it to happen before I believe it. Uh, but the mm-hmm. the solutions are clear, and I think we executed on it. I saw the comments. I think I, I saw somebody say, hey, looks like in this podcast network, we got to see an idea of how the Charlotte Hornets might operate about how what they could get in return, which, you know, in this scenario, in this universe, we'd have to have the Spurs agree to that. And we don't think the Spurs would agree to that in real life. At least I don't think that I, I don't think so. They were asking for P.J. Washington and two first round picks at the deadline. For Jakob Pertl just last year, I don't think they would do that for five spots in front and Kelly Oubre, you know, so like there, there's a little bit of that difference. Maybe yeah, I, I, I would think I would think the Hornets would jump all over that if they could do it. Spurs and, are in a uh, different situation. I mean, they are really in not like complete teardown, but they are getting super young. So, you know, they, they might be in a slightly different situation than when they when they, you know, offered that opportunity to the Hornets before the Mark Williams Jalen Duran stuff is like I I think for me the clear separators between the two are the passing of Duran I I fully buy into that and the ability to move on the perimeter is there's a gap there you know even if he's not Bam Adebayo Jalen Duran there's still a pretty big gap in my opinion and that's ultimately what was the separator for Richard I don't think he saw nearly as big of a gap in the passing as I did. And he said there is some of that to Mark Williams game. I find that so important. If you, especially with a LaMelo ball offense, I, we don't know how this offense is going to look with whatever coach decides to come in, whether it be Dan Tony or Atkinson, James Borrego had an offense that very much so liked ball movement. And that was one of the things I liked about Borrego. If your center can pass, and he can defend the rim, that's huge. I think that is an awesome skill set to have out there on the floor. And so if Mark Williams has that a little bit in his game, we've talked about the shooting touch, then okay. Like I can see why you might have that gap a little closed. But the passing to me, I I, I think there still is somewhat of a significant gap there. And that's why I would have Duran ahead of Mark Williams. Still like Mark Williams at 13, you know, by all accounts, as long as Duran's gone. So let me give you some names of players that we passed up on. And my question to you would be like, which of these names are you most um, anxiety ridden about passing up on these players? Because if you look over the history of our mock drafting, oh, let me just, before I give you the names of the players that we passed up on, let me, let's just take a trip down memory lane all the way back to 2017 uh, when we traded back from 11 we traded with the raptors now we got john collins at 23 we gave up lamb in the 11th pick for Corey joseph uh baby noguera and the 23rd pick we got john collins but we passed up on donovan mitchell we passed up on jared allen we passed up on tyler hero in 2018 uh we the charlotte hornets selected at 11 lonnie walker that's on me i fell in love with lonnie you've heard the bump a thousand yeah, times i didn't hate it you know like that that was definitely your draft rose but i i wasn't trying to fight you on it i like uh, you know walker. i still believe lonnie we got a lot of ball left to play but we did pass up on shea we passed up on miles well, bridges yeah. 
We passed up on uh, Robert Williams, who's uh, doing. Yeah. He's injured, but he's doing some fine work in the finals right now. Mitchell Robinson, I, I don't think that was really in range, but um, players that we could like have traded back for. Yeah, he yeah. went twenty nine in real life. Uh, in the mock draft, and then all right, let's go to twenty nineteen. So we uh, traded with Brooklyn. Uh, we got the seventeenth pick and the twenty seventh pick. So we got two first round picks for uh, the twelfth pick. And we ended up with Bull Bull at 17. Bull Bull! <laughs> Again, <laughs> that's, that's on guy. me. And, and then Keldon Johnson at 27, who, again, is still hey, cooking. Hey, that's in, a good one. That's a good pick. I it's like cooking in Kelton. San Antonio system right now. Again, we've got a lot. It's all these players that right now have been stuck in, in San Antonio obscurity but are seeming right. to, uh, to, be, to be ready to compete at some point. But here's some players we passed up on. P.J. Washington, who went 21st. Grant Williams, um, how was Tyler Hero again? I guess maybe there was some declaration or something that happened. In but he made you thought he was drafted before that or something, or yeah, yeah. Well, we pat we I think we passed up on him twice because I think Tyler Hero was drafted, hmm. um, in another draft. That's interesting. Um, we probably did the mock draft before the you know before the players actually declared for the draft. Anyway, uh, passed up on Hero. And so, you know, we, we passed up on quite a bit of players going to 2020 really quickly. Uh, we went three overall. We went on Yeka Kongwu because LaMelo Ball was selected first overall. Anthony Edwards. Second. Oh, oh was, LaMelo was first. Okay. So LaMelo never, was not, first. So we passed up on Killian Hayes, Okoro, Vassell, Wiseman went seventh, Halliburton. You know, again, yeah, in, this, Halliburton, in this context, yeah. in the context yeah. of this mock sure. draft, you know, that, that might have been a miss. Yeah, Halliburton. I, I mean, I too soon. I don't think Probably too soon to tell. Yeah, but a Kongwu, I, I I like what he's shown so far. I I, I thought Lamella was still available when we did that, but that uh, that would have been bad. I love Devin Vassell, another spur. Um, but yeah, all right. It's not it's not bad. It's not it's not awful. So which of I, these names? So let me give you the names of the people we passed up on. Which do you feel like will be sort of a Donovan Mitchell situation? Um, we passed up on Malachi Branham, Nikola yeah. Jovic. Tari Eason, uh, Marjan Beauchamp, EJ Little, Ochai Abaji before you get to Jalen Williams. So that's after Mark Williams. Before th- There's a Williams sandwich there. Who do you think we passed up on that we might regret? Malachi Branham is the guy that I really like. And, it, you know, somebody put it in the comments, too, the, the strategy that we went with in the first mock draft that we did. You select a wing slash guard what not a big because you feel so comfortable that cleveland isn't going to draft one at 14 and so we selected johnny davis in that draft and then went with mark williams at 15 but here we decided let's just take the big guy that's available go with mark williams it did cross my mind to maybe go with malachi branham and then wait on mark williams i don't think you know like you could had a you could have had a trade at 14 but Mark Williams would have been available at 15 here too. But you don't want to risk that because imagine passing up on Mark Williams at 13, somebody swooping in, getting him at 14, even if it's not Cleveland, and then you don't have another big guy, and now you are, you now you are pigeonholed at having to try to figure out something at free agencies or during free agency. So uh, Malachi Branham's the guy. I, I don't mind missing out on everybody else there before we get to Jalen Williams, but Malachi I'll Branham. Tell you. Really like him. I'm a little scared of Nikola Jovic, another Serbian sensation, uh, more than a nine-foot standing reach, more than a seven-foot wingspan. I'm just scared that the Hornets are you know, in, in our mock draft that we just missed out on the next MVP of the league. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about him as much. I need to do more research on Jovic. Like the other guys, Tari Eason, we've talked about. We talked about Ochai Abaji. He worked out for the Hornets. So the guys that could go in the Charlotte Hornets range of 13 and maybe even more so 15, it's been Abaji, it's been Eason, and it's been Kennedy Chandler, the point guard from Tennessee, who also I I, I like. Um, but just probably you could go with somebody else there with LaMelo on the team, but that's it. The Hornets haven't, they've worked out a ton of guys and they haven't worked out a ton of players that theoretically could be picked with that 13th or 15th pick. Jalen Williams, honestly, Doug, I it's, it's Malachi Branham and Jalen Williams and no Branham. So, you know, we get Williams there. Um, 
I this is somebody that I would be thrilled to get on this roster. You know, I went over it just in the second segment how much I liked him, right? But yeah, mm-hmm. I just think he he's going to be a fit really with a ton of different teams because he can do so much. Um, you know, defensively, like I guess I worry a little bit, but not much. You know, I, I offensively he's so gifted in a bunch of different areas. I did think about Blake Wesley, like I said, you know, Notre Dame <laughs> athlete will steal that pass that he baits you into making in the passing lane like that that's a really fun part of his game where you'll you'll think he's not paying attention and then he runs the other way and is fun in transition even if he didn't finish well at the rim at all like you know one year sample size it's you you can maybe fix that um yeah. I, I like Blake Will- Wesley's ability defensively he's really good so that that was one of the other things but I, I rode with Jalen Williams because there's so many other things he does well well I think we solved the center position but what we didn't solve is wing defense they're still going to, going yeah. to need that now some of that has to happen internally you you have to find a way to re-sign Cody Martin if you're interested in that or go out and find uh, a free agent, a wing defender that you can fit in with, again, an exception or or what have you. But it's if you're going to re-sign Miles Bridges to 25-plus, then you're going to need much better defense from him. LaMelo Ball has to improve his defense. Terry Rozier has to commit uh, to the defensive end as well. So it's one thing we didn't solve in this draft because we opted to go after Pirtle and to draft Mark Williams. A lot of options for the Hornets, uh, and we've got a lot more of those options to talk about with our friend Richard Stamen of the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast coming up later this week. Yeah, lots of fun conversations that we've had with him about we have a big man segment coming up because it's such a clear need for the Hornets, so we'll dive a little deeper into Duran and Mark Williams. But more information, Walker Kessler, where Richard Stamen has Walker Kessler ranked on his big board. You and won't maybe- believe it. No, you really won't. And uh, also maybe some second round bigs that might be available for the Hornets at 45 or just another player to select there um, with some second round uh, options they have. So we have a big man segment coming up. We'll play a name game in another segment. So lots of fun with Richard Stamen on the horizon, uh, horizon here on the Locked On Hornets podcast. All right, thanks for joining us. We always appreciate your support. Thanks for making us your first listen. Now make sure your second listen is Locked On NBA Big Board. Host Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and author of the NBA Big Board newsletter. He's joined by our buddy Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leaf Tulin, giving fans an in-depth look into the NBA draft, mock draft, player rankings, and of course, big boards. It's free and available wherever you get your pods. That was fun. We'll do it again tomorrow, right? here on the Lockdown Hornets podcast.